There were several questions that were posed in the chat box, and we will go through those here verbally as well. If you have additional questions, please don't hesitate to put them up in the chat, and we'll, we'll get to them. The first question I wanted to, to raise is for Rick, and that's whether or not they're within your project are you coordinating with 4-H or Future Farmers of America or other agricultural programs? Um, you know, and what is the value of that um, for your sustainability project? Oh, yes, we are exploring uh, opportunities to utilize this activity with 4-Hers and potentially other groups. But uh, nothing yet has been solidified or confirmed. But we're pretty optimistic about the, the prospects. Great. Um, a similar question or a related question to your presentation, Rick, was about online capabilities for children that are homeschooled. Or another way to put it is, um, what's the applicability or opportunity for homeschooled children, with, not only with your project, but also maybe perhaps, Tommy, with yours? You could maybe jump in after Rick. Well, all of the material that we're developing as, as part of this project, once we finish our infrastructure for on online delivery, it will be publicly available for anyone to access and, and use as they see fit. So uh, that's a, a, a great opportunity for, for homeschoolers to get access to it if they choose to. Great. Thanks. Uh, there was a question for Ron with the... Uh, exhibit that you described, was there a specific age group that you were aiming that exhibit toward? Who would it be appropriate for? I believe it would be uh, probably age six on up. Um, we didn't really target a specific age group for this, but uh, we thought if we made it wide-ranging enough, interactive enough, fun enough, we could uh, really uh, you know, reach a, a wide variety of uh, age groups, age people. Were reading skills necessary to, to move around and appreciate the course. Of course, yes. Okay. Yes, yeah, very much so. Um, so that's probably why I'm saying age six on up would uh, probably find the greatest benefit um, from the exhibit. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a question about contact information, and contact information for Ron and all the other presenters are available in the flyer. Al, there were some questions on on just odor in general. One of the questions being explaining the concept of being nose blind when exposed to specific odors for a period of time. Could you elaborate yes. on your answer? Uh, nose blindness uh, refers to habituation or adaptation. And when we are exposed to an odor continuously after some time, we, we don't sm uh, perceive that odor as much as we did initially. And so one example is our own body odor. Uh, we get used to it, and we don't. We're not. We're not uh, uh, alarmed by it, or offended by it, or, or even notice it. But someone else comes up and gets exposed to it. They they, they might have whether it's a perfume or uh, uh, an offensive body odor. Uh, they will smell it right away. And another example I gave was astronauts who go up to replace the astronauts up in, in the International Space Station have have told me that when they open the hatch and go in there, it is just a tremendously offensive odor. And the astronauts that are there say, what odor? <laughs> we don't smell anything. So that's the example of uh, adaptation. But after you get out of that odor, then your nose will clear, and then it'll start all over again when you get re-exposed. And so it's, a, it's in a way, it's possible for people to become less offended by an odor. Would that be correct? I, I, at least to some extent, because I, I can feel offended again as I get re-exposed to it mm -hmm. after being away from it for quite some time. My nose is, is not perceiving that anymore, and then and when, I, when, I, when I smell it again, then I can be perhaps offended as, uh, as much by it as I was the first time. But if, I, if that odor stays with me, so for example, if I go into a barn and work for several hours, after a while I get used to it and I don't really notice it. But, but it's still there. I, I still know that there's an odor there, but I'm, it's not as um, perceived as strongly um, after continuous exposure. So there's a relationship there, with, or more so with the change in, a, in the sensation versus the actual level of the sensation in a way. That is correct. Great, thank you. 
Tommy, I have a question for you. You talked about several different formats for, for modules or formats within a module for mm -hmm. teaching. Did you find that any one format was more popular than others with the youth audience in particular? Um, I am not sure. I would say, and, and Jill can jump in uh, as well, um, our advisory committee, which was you know, a broad base of ag industry and ag education stakeholders, you know, they indicated that we should be providing um, broad-based materials within our modules to meet a variety of needs that uh, a teacher may have. You know, for example, we may have a very robust module, but the teacher could choose to play two three-minute YouTube clips that we provided and then jump right into the class debate or discussion exercise that we provided. Um, so really, um, we have not done the follow-up research on you know how they were really deployed, only that that was a recommendation of this uh, broad-based set of, of stakeholders, that they should be as dynamic and versatile as possible, the modules themselves. And um, they were fairly uniform across the set, uh, with the exception of the two Colorado State uh, small-scale poultry and small ruminant production modules. They were, those were very much um, longer format video based. Okay. Uh, along the same lines or on your, regarding your presentation, you, you made a nice uh, kind of call for action to develop a way to market these modules to teachers. What, thus far, is there a way to do that? Um, how, how are teachers, whether it's in the ag ed curricula or otherwise, alerted to mm -hmm. new material for a specific, um, you know, code, let's say? Right. Well, as far as our materials, um, we uh, pushed those out through our, our connections with our advisory committee. We had a, um, a pretty nice article in um, an academic slash popular press, Ag Education Magazine for Professionals. Um, and that was a real nice profile of why this project was important, how it was easy to use. Um, you know, so that, that was essentially a marketing opportunity, right, to get out in this Ag Ed magazine that Ag Ed teachers uh, get through their professional membership. Um, you know, I think that um, pursuing a, a small mini grant or something to get um, a project representative out to the National Ag Ed Conference, you know, with a, a booth and uh, perhaps a, a presentation as well. Um, in the sessions uh, would be very valuable. Um, and I think now that these exist, they're also a tool that a education researcher could use perhaps in a study to try and measure improvement in food fiber and environmental literacy, you know, of course in that agricultural context or um, providing agricultural context to other STEM type uh, courses. Um, I think that's these could be utilized in a bigger research question like that. Um, and of course, there would also be marketing value uh, there as we tried to pilot test these modules once again with a broader student audience. Thank you. One last question here that just came up on the poll, which I, or on the chat box, which I believe is directed to you, Tommy. And that's whether these um, educational modules are geared to generating innovative efforts with the students. I guess I interpret that to mean, are, are you trying to learn or discover new um, environmental stewardship methods with these students, or generate some well, new ideas? That's a great question, and it, it follows along with um, a topic of discussion within the LPELC leadership team where we have really talked about um, how do we recognize innovation that's coming from the farmer ranch level, right? The, the innovations and awesome ideas that farmers, ranchers, and, and ag workers generate themselves. And I would, you know, extend that that question to students. Our project um, did not necessarily lend itself to receive that feedback, although with some of, like, the project ideas or science fair ideas uh, within the modules, um, I think that would encourage students to, you know, enter into their own great appropriate scientific process uh, to address, you know, issues, questions, problems, um, you know, related to livestock and poultry production. Thank you. 
have a question for you, Ron. In, um, in your opinion, is that the stamp or the license, you know, when getting all those different stamps on that license, was that a really effective way to move kids around the multiple exhibits? You know, is that something that um, you would recommend for, for other projects that really want to emphasize multifaceted approaches? We really did. Um, you know, we thought the more interactive it could be, the more hands-on things that kids could do, the more they would get out of this. And, they, you know, we needed to give them a take-home, something that they could take with them when they were done at the exhibit and, and really, you know, refer back to that or, you know, read it to, to fully understand uh, what they'd seen and, and just learn a little bit more about manure management in Iowa. Great. Yeah, I noticed the, the actual stamp, how <laughs> you actually stamped there in, the, in your pictures, and I hadn't thought of that method before. You know, uh, this is, um, pardon me, this is Tommy. I, living in the land of national parks, um, you know, the Junior Ranger program uh, is so popular. My own kids, nieces and nephews and children we observe and we're down in the parks. Um, they go through those observational learning activities and get their their books stamped and get their junior ranger certification at the end of a, a day of experiential learning and, and they seem to eat it up um, and that seems to be exactly what uh, the Iowa group did. That is very cool. Yep, thank you. Yeah, we were, we felt we needed uh, to, you know, make a statement, if you will, um, and something that the kids could be proud of to take with them. So, and, and plus it was a fun activity to, to put the stamps on too. So they were learning something at the same time. Thank you. Al, I have a question for you, um, kind of uh, looking toward the future. Have you considered using the essential oils for exploring or explaining that concept of hedonic tone? Uh, no, well, I have I have not uh, actually, but there is I have not done this yet. But I, I guess I I have to say that the answer is yes. I have considered it because the 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 uh, from Germany there is a standard for uh, training panelists on how to rank hedonic tone, and they use a couple of chemicals, and I, I don't recall whether they're actually hedonic, uh, essential oils or not, uh, that they might be, but there are some some chemicals that uh, they suggest, okay, if the panelists would, would smell this chemical, that they should say that that has a hedonic tone of minus three, for example. Yeah, what I'm thinking along the lines of, too, for, for a spring fest or a carnival type approach is demonstrating, you know, the differences between people as well, um, what pe some people might find um, more pleasant, some people might find a little bit more unpleasant, and even a demonstration of that difference between our noses. Sure. I think that's a good idea, and, and one could tally the results as the, um, as the fair goes on and, and then show people mm -hmm. what the results have been, or, or perhaps what the results were from the previous year. Great. Uh, Rick, a um, question for you. Um, you mentioned part two of your activity, which you didn't have a lot of time to go into, but it includes a simulation, right? right. Could you briefly describe what that simulation is? Right, sure, sure. Now, for the simulation, what we do is after the, the youth go through the resource material and they have been uh, fairly informed on the subject matter, we actually ask them to act in the role of a virtual uh, consultant for a producer to where in the scenario, the uh, scenario would outline the uh, type of operation and the uh, amenities that the operation has. <clears throat> and then it would ask the consultant that based on the uh, producer's preferences, could you design this, the, those three different uh, housing and, and feed and manure management systems in, in a manner that actually meets the needs of that given producer? Great. And have you been able to test drive that with your group of students as well or, or multiple groups of students yet? Well, that, that was actually, as I mentioned in the presentation, that was the, actually the original version and after going through that pilot what we found was that it was <clears throat> it was better to come back and step back in order to 
introduce that information at a level that didn't give that much uh, detail so as not to overwhelm the students. So that's why we came back and created part one to kind of ease the students into that material. Great, thank you.